Hello, sir. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, madam, I'm in the room. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, dear delegates. Uh, we'll start with the afternoon session. And uh, today's speaker is Dr. Namdev Jadu. Presently, sir, is working as a professor and head department of pharmaceutics, Bharti Vidyapit, College of Pharmacy, Kollapur. Sir has an experience of 22 years in the teaching and uh, he has many awards and grants to his, his credit. To name few, he is a recipient of Barrister P.G. Patil Ideal Teacher Award by the Shivaji University, Kollapur, in 2013. Best of Seva Gaurav uh, Puraskar Bharti Vidya Pune 2019. He has received uh, many uh, grants, like uh, he has also received the Junior Research Fellowship from uh, Ministry of Human Resource and Development, Government of India uh, in 1996 uh, to 1998. He was also a principal investigator for the project entitled Preparation, Stabilization, and evaluation of pure aloe vera juice and gel. And uh, it was sanctioned by Shivaji University, Kolapur, in 2016 to 2017. He was also a principal investigator for the project entitled Preparation and Evaluation of Tablet Formulations Containing Mulberry Leaves. It was sanctioned by, uh, it was also sanctioned by the Shivaji University, Kolapur, and uh, um, for, for rupees of about 25,000 grant. He has also received a travel grant sanctioned for the presentation of topic formulation and evaluation of curcumin dry powder inhaler by Department of uh, Science and Technology Education, Government of India, 33,000. Um, and uh, this was presented in the Asia in, in the year 2013. Sir was also the principal coordinator for two years for the entrepreneurship development cell activity entitled Enhancement of Entrepreneurship Avenue in Sericulture by Development of Mulberry Formulations and Guidance Cell, sanctioned by AICTE New Delhi. And for this, he received around 5 lakhs of the grant in 2013 to 2015. He was also the principal co-investigator for one-year faculty development program entitled uh, nanonization techniques and formulation product developments advances opportunities and challenges sanctioned by AICTE uh, for around 7 lakhs. He was also the principal investigator for the three years project entitled Amorphous Form Stabilization of Solid State Pharmaceuticals using Sericin, sanctioned by the CSIR New Delhi, that is of around uh, 11 lakhs in 2013 to 2016. Uh, for this, he has also had one uh, senior research fellow uh, who was, whose PhD thesis has been submitted. And uh, he was also the principal investigator for the for a project of two years entitled Tablet Formulation Design for Mulberry Leaves and Exploring Its Medicinal Importance, sanctioned by the Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, Mumbai, Maharashtra, uh, for 1,25,000 uh, in 2016 to 2018. Sir has many national and international publications, like sir has national pub, uh, uh, publications of 20 and international publications of 67. Sir has presented uh, various research papers in the national and international conferences 
national wear 50 and the international wear 10. Also, sir has to his credit one patent which is granted and five patents which are five. So with this uh, brief introduction, I welcome you, sir, for this uh, quality improvement program. And uh, sir is going to present today a topic, leveraging pharmaceutical formulation developments to, through recycled sericulture. Even though sir is from the pharmaceutics background, we can see from his uh, uh, regime or from the CV that he is uh, more towards the formulation of natural products. products. So with this brief introduction, I welcome you, sir, and we hand over the session to you. Thank you, sir. Welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, madam. Thank you for your nice introduction. I'll just share with you. Yes, sir. You can uh, start the uh, yes. sharing the slides. Ma'am, is this slide visible? Hello, ma'am. Is this slide visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It is visible. Okay. <clears throat> At the outset, uh, I would like to thank Dr. P. M. Dangi, sir, and uh, Principal Dr. Sunil Jalalpuri, sir, for giving me an opportunity to speak over here. The topic with which we are going to deal today is leveraging pharmaceutical formulation developments to recycle sericulture waste. My dear colleagues, you all be knowing a lot about sericulture industry. And uh, when we talk about sericulture, specifically, we deal, we think of silk which is being made out of sericulture industry, or you can say sericulture farming. But unfortunately, we find there are so many things which are associated with the sericulture industry, which usually we overlook. The mainline industry is silk making, whereas secondary industries are there, which are never looked upon into India at least. If you take a review of like global happenings, you will find there are so many countries, those who are dealing with the sericulture secondary industries, and uh, we have overlooked it. So my basic interest is to look upon what are those secondary things which are associated with the sericulture, how they can be used and specifically i must tell you we are going to talk something about sericulture wares how they can be used in pharmaceutical applications let it be pharmaceutical formulation related application let it be something like like as a, as a medicinal dosage form app related application so anything it can be let it be like a novel drug delivery system which you are going to develop so our basic focus is you can make this sericulture farming profitable with the help of use of all those sericulture wets in pharmaceutical formulations, that is the bottom line of what presentation I'm going to make, maybe for one hour or you can say one hour and uh, uh, 30 minutes. And uh, finally, I'm going to speak a bit about how the sustainable developments can be brought into the sericulture farming through startup opportunities which are available. Now, as Madam, uh, while reading my biodata, to some extent highlighted, there are certain uh, uh, obviously projects which have been sanctioned to me and I have worked on those projects and I have tried to compile all those things in this presentation. So initially, we'll be talking about certain applications of sericine, which is a major waste of sericulture industry because you know very well. So when we talk about sericulture, we get a cocoons and these cocoons are essentially composed of fibroid, which you call it as a silk. And second, there is one more cementing substance, which is called as a sericine. Now this sericine is contributing to the weight of 30% of the cocoon and fibroid is contributing to the extent of 70%. Unfortunately, in India, you will find whatever this sericine is there, it is literally connected to the drainage line. No one thinks of recovery of the sericine. Fortunately, in certain countries, you find sericine has been recovered. Now, second, uh, second application, what I'm going to talk about uh, during the presentation, like there are a lot of ways which are involved in the fibroid itself. So let it be jointed fibers, small threads of the silk, or which is also called as fibroid, that is also wasted. And we are trying to you know, establish its pharmaceutical applications. Obviously, it's not something new what I'm going to speak to you people. It is something which is routine, but our objective was to get that waste and use it for pharmaceutical applications. Now, the third waste of uh, this agriculture industry is like for rearing of the silkomes, like uh, what you need to do, you need to use mulberry leaves for rearing of the silkomes, or it's a food for uh, silkomes. And uh, whatever leaves are there, so majority of times, these mulberry leaves are surplusly produced. 
sometimes whatever spent leaves are there so there is huge burden of those mulberry leaves and we are going to think of like in what prospective way that can be formulated into certain you know dosage form which is of medicinal importance we are going to speak about that one also and ultimately next one is like uh, how the sustainable developments can be carried out into sericulture along with some startup opportunities that our own experience now friends if you talk about global scenario of sericulture you will find china is the biggest you know cultivator of mulberry or biggest producer of silk across the globe so china contributes to the extent of 80% of world's requirement whereas india contributes to the extent of 15% of world's requirement and whatever is left out 5% that is contributed by brazil italy france japan russia korea in addition to this now two more countries have started cultivation of this mulberry or you can sericulture farming so one is uh, that cuba and second is thailand now globally this is figure of 2018 what i'm going to show you globally whatever dry cocoons are produced usually you know they uh, are uh, weighed in terms of dry cocoon so these cocoons uh, which are produced globally it's a 2018 figure so it's 4 lakh metric ton and from these cocoons which are weighing 4 lakh metric tons whatever silk fibers you make so they are to the tune of 1 lakh 59648 metric tons now specifically china contributes the silk 1 lakh 20000 metric tons and india it is close to 35 lakh something metric tons so whatever sericulture industry in india we have is one third of china is one third of china and very meager amount of silk is contributed by rest of the countries now specifically when we talk about indian scenario you will find karnataka is you know biggest state which has got plenty of seri farming almost close to i think 1.5 lakh hectares of land is under sericulture farming the next comes like andhra is there then tamil nadu is there then west bengal is there then manipur is there then uh, um, uh, himachal pradesh is there so these are the states and specifically in maharashtra also you will find certain people they go for sericulture farming especially regions of mahabaleshwar and nearby to the kolapur to so be nearby to the kolapur we have got a elgood elgood this is a small village so where we find sericulture farming and even nearby to the islampur so this is another a small remote uh, pocket where we find a, a sericulture farming so here so what why i am telling this this is so important for us because nearby to us a lot of waste is being generated in terms of sericin as i said as a first waste second in terms of like uh, whatever fibroin i said and third one mulberry leaves which are being produced which are being cultivated as a feed material for the silkworms now if you think these three wells and if you try to explore certain applications for those probably so this is going to make this sericulture farming very very viable and additionally it will open up new avenues for pharmaceutical industry as well it is going to give you something new and what we have tried i'll be showing during the due course of our presentation so this is something background which i would like to show you so basically silk is of two types one is called as mulberry silk and second is called as uh, non mulberry silk so when we say mulberry silk means whatever silkworms are there or silk worms are there so name of that genus and species is bombyx mori so they are reared on the morus indica it's a name of plant morus indica is a name of plant and second is morus alba so now morus indica is a variety which has been indigenously developed in india and morus alba is the one which has got plenty of medicinal importance so silk which is produced by rearing of silkworms on the morus genus is called as mulberry silk this is commercially used and second is non mulberry silk second is non mulberry silk so basically this non mulberry silk is made out of wild plants so they are basically tasarak silk then moga silk iri silk and oak silk so they are reared on different wild plants so this is what in marathi we resinous means you know very well eran it is something which you find usually in the farm in maharashtra so these are the silks which are made on wild plants and they are called as non mulberry silk specifically non mulberry silk is being you know made in northeast region of the india because you know they they have got you know uh, thick uh, you know plants and all those things so because of which uh, you find non mulberry silk in northeast region no actually uh, i feel it is very important one should know how the silk worm rearing is carried out and then we'll go to the pharmaceutical applications this is what is a mulberry farm this is what these are the you know plants of the mulberry and uh, so these leaves which are lush green leaves they are eaten by the silkworms so this is silkworm or larva what you can call it as and uh, 
so here you can find in the sericulture farm you find these kind of rearing houses are built by the farmers and this is in a view of this actual rearing process so this lady is spreading all those you no know, silkums on whatever leaves have been spread on those trees and ultimately after say one and a half month or you can say two month you get this kind of you know cocoons so these cocoons now what have been shown here they have got a, inside that silkum which is called as pupa and these are the secretions which are being made by this pupa or silkum and these secretions are essentially composing of fibroin and sericin so it has got fibroin fibers and uh, it has got cementing substance which is sericin so here you can have a look at it see so as we said in the beginning so 4 lakh metric tons of cocoons are produced every year approximately this is 2018 figure and so whatever this sericin is shown here with the help of arrow you will find this sericin is a cementing substance sericin is a cementing substance what it is doing it is cementing these two fibroin fibers this is one fibroin fiber this is another fibroin fiber now this is acm image now so this cementing substance is the glycoprotein this fibroin is also glycoprotein so both things are proteinic in nature and this sericin is a glue like and because of which it has got very strong you know binding ability it firmly binds the fibroin it firmly binds the fibroin but what is our interest the so people are mainly interested in separation of this fibroin fibers people are least bothered about this sericin because they don't think of it it is something like a wasp from their view point what is important for them is a fibroin what you call it as a silk what you call it as silk but see if you see as i said in the beginning 30% of weight of this cocoon is contributed by the sericin 30% of weight is contributed by the sericin and 70% is fibroin means when you are separating silk from the cocoon 70% weight is of fibroin 30% is sericin and currently in india i must tell you so all those sericin are connected or you can say sericin west is connected to the drainage line no one thinks of recovery of the sericin how much is approximate you know the weight which can be recovered globally it is 50000 to 1 lakh metric tons in indian indian scenario obviously this is going to be a significant figure so sericin as i said it's a protein i must tell you i must share my experience with you initially when i started working on this maybe in 2000 way back 2011 or 2012 at that time we wanted to purchase a sericin for certain applications to be explored as a standard so we purchased 10 g of sericin for 2000 10 g sericin for 2000 and you can just imagine how much sericin we are wasting you cannot just imagine we are wasting in metric of tons we are throwing it out additionally it is creating you know issues of bioburden and all those things these are apart so actually how the silk is separated that process is called as a reeling process now you will find so there are different methods which can be tried by people like uh, that process of separation of silk these are the silk fibers so what you can find here and uh, this this is the, these are the silk fibers and these are the silk cocoons so this process of separation of silk is called as a degumming of sericin so as the sericin is like a gum it's a glue like material so you need to separate it and uh, after separation after extraction of separating it's a extraction of sericin what you get is a silk these are the silk fibers the fibers which are you know you know long which have got a very good shine so they are you know good quality fibers which are collected which are you know being sold into the market usually the cost of these fibers is close to 1000 you know per kg and when you talk about uh, the cocoons they usually cost uh, 300 to 400 per kg now here you can just think whatever that larva was inside now it is called as pupa so this pupa is separated in this process the pupa is separated in this process in this container you will find the sericin has been dissolved sericin is hydrophilic protein fibroin is water insoluble protein and pupa is there so which has produced this cocoon so this pupa along with the sericin is connected to the drainage lines pupa along with the sericin is connected to the drainage lines so this pupa how much is cost of this pupa usually people sell it at sell it uh, uh, at say maybe say you know 3 4 5 rupees per kg if you might have i mean you might have gone to you know different countries you might have seen like or even in in uh, in case of northeast region of the india you will find so this pupa fried pupa is served as a welcome dish or it is you know widely consumed by the people because it is a rich of proteins it is called as energy capsule also because it has got so many micronutrients in it and that is why so this is very very important one has to think of because sericin again contains lot of essential amino acids then it is hydrophilic 
So it may be having certain applications and pupa is nutrient material. So these two things are thrown away literally. And second thing is that whatever small fibers are there, which are, you know, silk fibers, jointed fibers, they are also waste and they are thrown by the people. And what made us to think, can we recycle those? Maybe let it be fibroid fibers are there, sericin is there, pupa is there, or you can say mulberry leaves are there. So that was our attempt and accordingly we went ahead. So to some extent, we should know what is, you know, chemistry of seriously, because whenever as a formulator, we have to think of formulation design, you know, any kind of dosage form when we uh, go for, so we think of what are physical chemical properties of drug along with the polymers. If I have to explore sericin for pharmaceutical application, so I need to know this. So it has got water soluble nature. It is hydrophilic in nature because it has got plenty of hydrophilic amino acids. The molecular weight is 10 to 300 kilodalton. Then polar amino acids are there, as we said in the beginning. Now, currently, this is being tried in India in the cosmetic industry. Rarely, it is used commercially as a food material and as a biomaterial, at least in India. So basically, there are different type of uh, basically there are different type of sericins. Sericin A, B, C, depending upon the nitrogen content, depending upon the solubility, and uh, it is available in two forms. Alpha form is amorphous form. Beta form is crystalline form. So here you can have a transition of alpha to beta, or you can have a transition of sericin from amorphous form to the beta form, which is a secondary structure, or you can say crystalline form. So these, you can have interplay between amorphous and uh, you know crystalline form of the sericin. So that is why it can be used in the soul as well as gel transformation. So you can prepare a gel, you can prepare a soul depending upon the type of sericin which is available. Beta will give you gel, you know very well. And if it is soul, obviously you are going to get out of the alpha form. It has got isoelectric pH of 4. Now, if you look at its properties, so obviously as a formulator, as a sutician, so we, we, we face a lot of problems of solubility of drugs. So this is a very common topic which is being addressed by the people. I'm not going to talk something which is new or something which is great. But here, 70% of drugs are poorly soluble. You know very well. And that's a challenge before we all. Rather, we would say that. So in Indian industry, what we do nowadays, you have heard a lot about repurposing of the drugs. And in addition to this, what we do, we try to improve the solubility of drugs. We modify physical chemical drugs as well as the polymers. And that is what a great thing what we are doing. And uh, you know that is the reason why Indian industry has grown up like anything. And obviously, AD is there along with that. Now, so sericin, if you see its composition, so it has got aspartic acid, which is hydrophilic, negatively charged amino acid. Then this is serine is there, which is aliphatic, polar amino acid is there. Glutamic acid is there. Again, it is negatively charged. Then lysine is there, which is positively charged. Then arginine is there. Again, it is positively charged. Then leucine, isoleucine, phenylalanine, valine, and histidine, these are essential amino acids. Now, if you see the net charge of sericin is negative because it has got plenty of, you know, negatively charged amino acids, aspartic acid, glutamic acid, you know, and because of which you will find the charge of sericin is usually negative. Now, serine is hydrophilic, and if you see the amino acids which are contributing for hydrophilicity, that percentage is even more than 50, 60. Aspartic acid is there, then serine is there, glutamic acid is there, then arginine, histidine, so lysine is there. So what made us to think, so can we use this seen in certain pharmaceutical applications which are novel. That was our concern. How, why we can use it? Because it has got, you know, basic source of charge. It has got positively charged amino acids. It has got negatively charged amino acids. So that was the one motive what, what, which, which dragged us, you know, so we can think of use of these charges, number one thing. Second thing is that, as we said, that 70% drug molecules are poorly soluble. If you use anything which is hydrogen bond formers, obviously one which is hydrophilic, which is water soluble, probably it may have certain application in enhancing the solubility. That was the second thing. Obviously, it is going to improve the dissolution as well. And whenever you talk about, like, say, transformation of crystalline form of drug to the amorphous form, this is one area which is liked by the pharmaceutical industry, you know very well. So where you just need to transform crystalline form of drug to the amorphous form. And this amorphous form of the drug, as it has got very high entropy, it has got very high energy. So this is disordered state of the, the material. And because of which it is it's highly reactive towards water, it has got you know very good solvation. And but because of high energy, because of more thermodynamic instability, so obviously it will try to prefer to have a devitrification, means conversion of amorphous form to the crystalline form. This is called as devitrification process. But if you are using some excipients, which are just going to take out energy, which is associated with this amorphous materials, obviously, when the energy is not there, so obviously those molecules which are going to favor devitrification, they will be seized. There won't be transformation of 
amorphous material to the crystalline material. So this is third thing what we thought of, can we have solution uh, in that uh, context? Now the next one is fibroin, because if you look at this fibroin, you will find so it is having plenty of non-polar amino acids. It has got glycine, alanine, and in addition to this, so many you know non-polar amino acids are there. And uh, its molecular weight is 22 to its molecular weight is 22 to 400 kilo Dalton. And uh, the established thing about fibroin is that you know that it has been widely used in the textile since time immemorial. Currently, a lot of applications are explored, a lot of applications are developed as far as use of fibroin as a biomaterial has been concerned. And to some extent, cosmetic industry is using this fibroin. So this fibroin again has got a negative charge because of the negatively charged amino acids. At neutral pH, it is going to give you very less viscosity. It has got very less viscosity at a neutral pH. Again, same thing is seen in case of this. It has got some alpha form as well as beta form. You find in case of sericin, you have got a plenty of alpha form, means amorphous regions there are more. In case of fibroin, you find plenty of beta forms, or you can say, you know, you have got a pleated structure. So that, that is what is secondary structure of the protein. So there you find, you know, crystalline form of fibroin. So in fibroin, you find more beta form. In sericin, you find more alpha form. That's why fibroin is more crystalline compared to the sericin. Sericin is amorphous, fibroin is crystalline. So both forms are interconvertible in both. So one has to keep in mind, its isolytic pH is 4.2. If you just have a look at its composition, it has got glycine. Again, it's a you know aliphatic non-polar amino acid. Then alanine, aliphatic non-polar amino acid, so whose you know the contribution is almost close to seventy percent. The serine is aliphatic polar amino acid. The tyrosine is aromatic amino acid. So here you can find almost seventy percent of contribution is given by glycine and alanine. That's what is the reason why this silk fibroid is non-polar. Why this silk fibroid is non-polar or it is poorly soluble. Right, and uh, that is the reason you know very well. Like uh, silk fibroid has been widely used by the people in ligatures as well as sutures, and it can stay in the body for you know months together. It's a biodegradable, being a protein, it's biodegradable. I must tell you, sericin. There are certain reports which are available. Sericin has shown certain antigenicity, whereas fibroin is non-antigenic because it has been used since long time and it has been tested for long time. It's a non-antigenic material. It's biodegradable, biocompatible, but non antigenic And because of high crystallinity, it can stay in the body for a very, very long time. Now, the third best, what we are going to talk about, so which is called as mulberry juice, as I said that, so Morus alba is a variety which has got plenty of medicinal importance. In literature, it has been reported as a tree of life, but it is also called as herb of immortality. So obviously, so when it is called as herb of immortality, that made us to think why it is called as herb of immortality. How does it give life to someone? The simple reason is that it has got plenty of phytoactives which are required by the body in the regular maintenance of the body. Along with that, in uh, along with that, may, may, many phytoconstituents are there. They are going to treat diseases or disorders. And overall, if you see the, you know, the, the spectrum of the chemical constituents, almost it covers all pharmacological activities. Almost it covers, you know, all, you know, uh, diseases which are major one, which usually people suffer from. And this mulberry leaves, they take care of it. So this is what is, we have taken it from the literature. It has got very good anti-diabetic potential because it has got one active, which is called as 1-DNJ. It's a pipidine kind of alkaloid, 1-deoxynosirimycin. It's a water-soluble alkaloid. And so whatever miglitol, which is available to the market, you might be doing that. Miglitol is a carbos category of antidiabetic, which is alpha glucosidase inhibitor. And this miglitol has been obtained from one DNJ, which is present in this mulberry juice. This one DNJ is added with only CH2OH. You get a miglitol and it is clinically available into the market. So one work we have carried out on this. The second thing is that, so it is having plenty of antioxidants because you know very well, all plants, they have got plenty of antioxidants. And uh, when antioxidants are in a plenty, obviously aging process is going to be blocked because you know very well, I need not to tell because for normal physiological processes to happen in the body. So what ultimate product is being produced is oxygen free radicals or you can say free radicals. If these free radicals are blocked, so obviously they can very well be blocked by the antioxidants. And uh, if these free radicals are blocked, obviously, whatever harmful effects of these free radicals are 
factor, so they won't be seen. And uh, so basically, these free radicals are responsible for aging process, you know, very well. And here you can have a process to mop those free radicals, and that is what a job which is done by the mulberry leaves. Now, third thing, I could find n number of references which are available for its anti-hyperlipidemia and anti-obesity applications. So it is a very good you know, agent which is reducing the cholesterol. Second thing, it is very good agent which is reducing the blood sugar. It is blocking the aging process. Moreover, it has got plenty of nutrients also. Mulberry leaves, calcium is there. So many things are there. Proteins are there. So many things are there in the mulberry leaves. If you look at this plant, so it is taking care of your body as a whole. It is stopping the oxidation process. It is stopping the you know effect of free radicals. It is stopping the aging process. It is taking care of diabetes. It is taking care of cholesterol. Then what else is left? So these are the major things. It is taking care of nervous system. And that is why that could be the reason why people call it as a herb of immortality. And that is why. So what we thought, let us try some activity of that, whether it is, you know, literally, I mean, whether it is really working well or it doesn't work, it doesn't work. So that's what we wanted to test. So what are those active constituents? One DNA is there, chlorogenic acid, rutin, isoquestrin, astragalene, coadol, moracin, rosmarinic acid. Although I'm not going to cover in this presentation, there is one uh, small, uh, you know, uh, research which we carried out on uh, this mulberry leaves. Uh, and we could find for a certain application, because we are going to file a patent on that, I'm not going to disclose it. So we could find a, uh, we could find a lead in that, which has got very good pharmacological action, one kind of pharmacological action, so, and uh, which has not been reported so far. So this is something, a plant, which has given a plenty of thanks to the research community and even as well, as will be people. The next one is, this is what is pupa, which is present inside the cocoons. What people do, People when go for separation of sericin, see, I'm not going to going to go into the much details of how the sericin can be separated. There are basically five methods. One is called as you know uh, autoclaving, then boiling in water, then acid treatments are there, alkali treatments are there, then enzymatic treatments like papain has been used for separation of the sericin. So these are certain methods which are used. And when you separate sericin, or what people do, people simply give an incision to the cocoon, they cut the cocoons and they separate this pupa. And this is widely consumed by the people. Why it is called as energy capsule, I must tell you, if you see this table, you will find everything is there which is required by the human. So calcium is there, phosphorus is there, nitrogen is there, nitrogen is there, then uh, cellulose is there, protein is there. So this pupa, this table is uh, for the pupa which is, you know, used for, uh, which is being reared on resinous commoners, which produces protein to the extent of 35 to 53, what you can have a look at here. But if it is real on mulberry leaves, the percentage of protein which is there in the pupa, you can have up to say 75% reports are there. So everything is there, proteins, carbohydrate, phosphorus, calcium, nitrogen, fibers, everything is there. And that's why it is called as energy capsule. In certain countries, this is being given as an uh, energy capsule to the soldiers. You know, so it has got a lot of energy, that's why. You can think of this because obviously this can be a very good way of getting national security as far as food has been concerned. Now here, this is first case study what I'm going to share with you. So what initially we did, we selected certain drugs belonging to the non steroidal anti drug category, NHIDs, which have got different hydrogen acceptor, hydrogen donor, and hydrophilicity and lipophilicity was different. So pelodipine was there. Oh, sorry, this is this, this, this was calcium channel blocker. Lornox cam was there and Malox cam was there. So all three had a different hydrophilicity and lipophilicity. Hydrogen donation count and hydrogen acceptor count, it was different. The essential criteria was they should be BCS2. BCS2 means you know that poorly soluble, highly permeable. And this is what is the structure of the sericine. Now, sericine has got plenty of OH where you can have hydrogen bond formation. Sorry. You have got oxygen, then nitrogen, so where you can have hydrogen bond formation. So probably what we thought, can this sericine have binding with the drug can be sericin have a binding with the drug and that was our work which we initiated with and uh, it may have some implication it may have some application in solubility as well as distribution improvements now yes we could prove that yes it is improving the solubility it is improving the dissolution but basically the main you know the domain or the main research which people usually you know focus upon is amorphous form generation from the crystalline material for poorly soluble drugs. Now, how you can do that? So there are various techniques you know very well. So 
so you can go for spray drying you can go for freeze drying you can go for even ball milling also ball milling also can generate you know amorphous material so this is what is amorphous material which is generated this amorphous material which is generated from this crystalline material so crystalline material is you know ordered state of the solute it is highly ordered state of the molecules and this is a disordered state of the molecules simply you can just take example of ball milling see if i have to ball mill this So obviously, I have to give a lot of input as energy, and when energy has been given, so so where that energy is going to go, the energy will be associated with this. That has been utilized for breaking of this crystalline arrangement. Whatever order state is there, now it has been made disorder, and this is called as amorphous form of the material, right? Now, for we as a formulator, for we as a solution, what we require, we need to have a dosage form. We need to have a drug. in a form which is more soluble because you know very well the essential thing for drug to show the pharmacological action or for therapeutic efficacy to be seen the drug has to go to the molecular level at molecular level drug goes absorbed drug gets absorbed exception is nanomaterial of full size if it is less than 50 nanometer obviously it can cross the bio membrane non selectively so that is case with the nano you know very well so now here our objective is transform this crystalline material into either this molecularly dispersed form or amorphous form so molecularly dispersed means whatever you know emulsion systems which you prepare solid self emulsifying solid you know uh, micro emulsifying so all those systems these are molecular dispersed systems and here so whatever breakdown you can carry out by ball milling or you can say spray drying or uh, maybe say freeze drying you are going to get this state as we said so this state you get after giving energy input obviously energy which is associated with this system is very high and that's why the entropy of amorphous material is very high entropy is such a thing which cannot be easily recovered you know very well it's a degree of you know randomness or disorderness because of which because of high energy associated with this amorphous particles so they favor devitrification they favor devitrification via nucleation via nucleation so so whatever molecules are there so they because of high energy because of high energy they try to bind with each other so that energy will come down to zero and this process is called as nucleation this is possible in case of amorphous materials so after nucleation you will generate a semi crystalline or you can say partially crystalline so material and on storage maybe because of say you know certain temperature conditions humidity conditions air moisture dust particles you know on storage so this amorphous material gets converted to the crystalline material for certain drugs you will find the type required is say maybe say in few days you can have a transformation of amorphous form to the crystalline form in certain materials it may take few months in certain it may take years together so that depends upon the material and the surrounding where it has been exposed so here this process of devitrification is possible when you store it for long time so whatever amorphous material is there it will be getting converted to the semi crystalline on storage and uh, this semi crystalline material is going to get converted again back to the crystalline form crystalline form has poor solubility amorphous form has got very high solubility because of high entropy but the problem is devitrification process when the problem is devitrification process and it is because of the energy initially we vitrified it by energy input by liberation of energy by utilization of that energy in the bond formation again we get a crystalline form so now if we are able to use some excipient if you are able to use certain technique which is going to take out energy of this what will happen what will happen the molecules will be seized it will be like arresting those molecules where there is no energy so this energy can be taken out so you can use certain polymers which are going to form bond with it which are going to form bond with it and once the bond has been formed so whatever energy was associated with this amorphous materials now this energy has been used for preferentially bond formation with those polymers now those drug molecules now they don't have energy because it has been used for bond formation with the polymers and because of which this nucleation process is not going to be seen so devitrification is not going to be there and this is called as amorphous form stabilization which can be carried out and essentially this can very well be done with the hydrophilic polymers plenty of reports are available if you just go through you will find plenty of research papers now how this amorphous form can be stabilized because this is very important to stabilize the amorphous form as we said first part like hydrogen bonding or electrostatic interactions anyhow you use that energy for bond formation it can be hydrogen bond formation or electrostatic interactions you can have second is anti plasticizing effect of the polymer you can use the polymer you can 
This is a, basically, uh, this is used for increasing the glass transition temperature. I guess you know very well what is glass transition temperature. We need not go into the much details of it. So anti-plasticizing polymers can be used so, so that the glass transition temperature of the polymer or you can say drug will be raised or it will go high. So that is one technique which is used by the people. So at ordinary temperature, at body temperature, at room temperature. See, because of, see, I, in, in brief, I would like to tell you, you might be doing, but still I'll repeat. The glass transition temperature is a temperature below which the substance is available in amorphous state. Above this glass transition temperature, substance is let it be polymer or drug, whatever it is. Above this glass transition temperature, it is available into the rubbery or glassy, uh, rubbery or supercooled liquid or viscous state, which is very, very sticky state, which is very, very sticky state. So below glass transition, substance is available in amorphous state. Above glass transition, it is a rubbery state. And for we people, obviously, we will prefer a polymer which is non sticky. Obviously, we will prefer a polymer which is non viscous. So, what if, if I have to prepare a tablet? So, obviously, I will prepare a, prefer a polymer, I will prefer a drug which is in amorphous state instead of rubbery state. So, if you go for anti plasticizing polymers, glass transition temperature of that entire blend will be increased and it will be very high. And at room temperature, that system, that polymeric blend will be available in an amorphous state. So now next thing, what you can do, storage below the glass transition temperature, yes. What you can do, as we said that, glass transition temperature below that substance is available in the amorphous state. And above that, substance is available in the rubbery or viscous state. Say, for example, glass transition temperature of material is, say, you know, say 20 degrees Celsius. Glass transition temperature of material is 20 degrees Celsius and today's temperature is 30. It means that that substance is available in the sticky form. That substance is available in the rubbery form. You got it? That substance is available in the rubbery form and it is very difficult to handle it. There are so many issues which are associated with this. See, and if the glass transition temperature is very high, even more than room temperature, at room temperature, the substance is going to be, or let it polymer or drug, is going to be available in the amorphous form, which we can very well handle. Now, the basic thing, why as a formulator, I'm worried about this is, so as a rubbery material, as a sticky material, one thing is very, very clear, it has got poor processability. Second thing is that if you take a tablet, you can just take an example of tablet, it has got a drug, it has got a polymer, and this entire blend has got certain glass transition temperature. Not necessary each and every drug and polymer is going to show the glass transition temperature. Not necessary. So this blend entire tablet will have a certain glass transition temperature. And usually because of the plasticization procedure, because of moisture, because of water, glass transition temperature falls. Now imagine the case where, say, for example, I have got a tablet of whose glass transition temperature is, say, say, say 45 degrees Celsius. I have swallowed the tablet. When this tablet will go to my stomach, then you have got a plenty of water. It is going to bind with the polymer as well as drug. The temperature, uh, the glass transition temperature of this blend will fall because temperature of my body was 37 now. Tempra glass transition temperature of this tablet was 45. Since water was there, so water reduces glass transition temperature and it will reduce the glass transition temperature of this tablet from 45 to imagine say 37. Now what, what is going to be scenario? The tablet which is going to be there, it is very sticky. <clears throat> it is going to have API which is you know, rubbery which is viscous and because of which it affects badly solubility as well as dissolution profile. You can have a dissolution which is very haphazard. You can have a solubility which is very, very, you know, uh, haphazard or you can say the things are very, very erratic. There won't be reproducibility at all. There won't be reproducibility at all. And that is why one has to be always concerned with what is going to be glass transition temperature of uh, your polymer along with the drug as well. So this is very, very important for us. We wanted to explore the application of that also. <clears throat> so initially what we did, uh, this is a data which we got from the certain chem databases. We have got Lornox chem, Melox chem, and Philodipine. Topological polar surface area is, you know, almost same for Lornox chem and Melox chem. Philodipine is least polar. You can have it just look at it. It has got 64. It has got very high. Average lipophilicity of Philodipine is very high. This has got relatively less lipophilicity. Means it is more hydrophilic. Melox chem is more hydrophilic. Hydrogen donors 2, 2, and here 1, acceptors hydrogen 6, 5, and 3. This is what is the surface map of sericin, which we have developed using homology model in our laboratory in college. So this blue color indicates hydrophilic domains of the sericin. 
and uh, this uh, yellow color indicates hydrophobic domain so obviously you can find more hydrophilic domains are available and uh, these are surface maps for the drugs this is more hydrophilic less and then pilodipine which is more lipophilic you can have a look at <clears throat> now the next thing is what initially we wanted to do virtually we tested whether these drug can bind with the sericin because as we said that for solubilization for dissolution for amorphous form hydration what you require you require is interaction of drug with the polymer our polymer is a proteinic in nature so essentially it has got amino acids so whatever drug are there so obviously they are going to interact with the amino acids and if it is interacting with the amino acids depending upon the type of interactions which have been involved so probably we can be in a position to judge yes it has it can have a better solubilization application or it can have poor solubilization or it can see dissolution application so that was the ultimate objective so first thing what we did say we docked lornox cam this is what is lornox cam which we docked with the sericin which we had uh, prepared by using homology modeling and here we could find that it binds at lysine 119 residue and the distance is 2.3 angstrom so you know very well so if the distance is less than 2.5 as far as hydrogen bond has been concerned it is treated as a strong bond and in case of hydrophobic interactions if distance is less than 5 angstrom then it is considered as a significant interaction so here lornox cam was binding with the lysine 119 residue then glutamine 113 and lysine 112 and this Three were two, three were hydrophobic interactions, and one was hydrogen bonding interaction. Now here, in case of Melox cam, you could find the distance is very less. In case of Melox cam, this lysine one one nine residue and Melox cam, this distance hydrogen bond is very very strong compared to previous, or you can say compared to Lornox cam and sericin. This is a strong bonding which has been involved. Even here, you find hydrophobic interactions as well. And in case of pelodipine, in case of pelodipine, you could find very weak interactions, and it was simple hydrophobic interaction. So what this tells us, it simply tells us, like Melox cam has got very strong bonding with the sericin, and just we wanted to validate it later on. So for that purpose, what we did initially, we went for phase solubility study, and uh, using phase solubility study, we could optimize what is the amount of sericin which has been required. So we could find at one s to two proportion, eight to ten fold increase in the saturated solubility of the drug was noted. And the methods which we tried for preparation of solid dispersions were physical mixture, then ball milling, solvent evaporation, and spray drying. We could find promising results in the spray drying followed by solvent evaporation. So solvent evaporation and spray drying they were giving very good results as far as solubility and dissolution improvements have been concerned. Ball milling and physical mixture they were not much attractive. <clears throat> This is what how the dispersion is going to look like. Say poorly soluble drug is the This is sericin, something like this is very common dispersion of drug. It's like polymeric network in which drug has been embedded. Now, one interesting thing what we find in the spray dry dispersion, as I said in the beginning, we could find a better results with the spray dry. You will be asking me, sir, like it is known to all if drug has been sprayed using spray drying. So obviously, irrespective of polymer, you are going to get amorphous system, right? So that's true, and we actually wanted to take advantage of that. So when sericin and drug have been spray dried, at that time you can very well tell yes. whatever amorphous form or amorphous solid dispersion has been generated it remains stable or it leads to the devitrification that we could very well tell if, uh, if that we could very well tell using the spray drying technique so here one interesting thing which we came across so in this case you you can find this is what is the first one is lornox cam melox cam then this is what is pelodipine and this is plain sericin which has been spray dried in first two things this is first one like say lornox cam solid dispersion with the sericin which has been spray dried and this is what is melox cam here interesting thing is that we could get a bowel morphology we could get a bowel morphology now whenever we uh, talk about say pulmonary drug delivery whenever we want to use such a polymers as a carrier for you know drug delivery applications this is of paramount importance we know very well so polymer should be able a carrier should be able to load the drug and this whatever bowel morphology is there we found x yes, it has got you know lot of potential to carry the drug on it drug can be filled into this and uh, it can act as a carrier maybe say for pulmonary drug delivery applications we are working on it actually and here you can find this is plain sericin which has been spray dried it has got spherical corrugated porous morphology and this can carry a plenty of drug so this is something uh, we, we which has opened a new area for pulmonary drug delivery applications but basically as i said in the beginning this sericin is antigenic in nature we are working on it how to deal with that and uh, hopefully we'll be able to work out something and uh, uh, establish this as a career for pulmonary drug delivery applications 
So for any dosage form to be prepared, so every solid dispersion, every raw material needs to be tested for its compressibility and compactibility. Or you can say micrometrics and uh, you know tabletability means tabletability when we say compressibility and compactibility. So spray dried Melox scam, it had a better profile compared to spray dried Lornal scam and spray dried Philodipid. So this is known to you all, envelope repose, cars, compressibility, HR, Hausner's ratio. This A and B stands for Kawakita. You know, these are Kawakita constants. The equation is N upon C is equal to N upon A plus 1 upon AB. So A is related with the flowability, B is related with the yield strength, B is inversely proportional to yield strength. Mean yield pressure is output of Heckel plot. And here it had a least mean yield pressure. It's a resistance which is offered by solid during compression. So whatever this ACDMS was there, it was offering least resistance for compression, means it was better compressible. And compactibility, it's nothing but your tensile strength. For how long it can remain, you know, integrated, I mean, how, for how long it can remain as a stable tablet, how strongly the bonding has taken place, that is judged by the compactibility to which you get compactibility and compression susceptibility you get from the Leerberger equation that you might be knowing sigma t is equal to sigma t max into bracket 1 minus e raised to you know, gamma into pressure into relative density. So this compression susceptibility is gamma and compactibility is sigma t max. So all this profile, all these you know, values were very good for spray dried Melox scam solid dispersion. So this is interesting. Now this we have got diprograms of uh, diffractograms of stability study samples. First one is Lornox scam. Second is Melox scam, and third one is Felidipin. Now you can just have a look at it. Lornox scam, this picks two theta indicates it's highly crystalline drug. Now, when we spray dry this Lornox scam alone in the solvent system, ethanol water 7030, when we spray dried it, you could get, yes, we could get this kind of diffractogram, which is free of picks, no picks. It indicates it, it has gone to the total amorphous form. Later, after one month storage, when we analyzed it, it was a drug alone. It was a plain drug. It was a plain drug. When we went for its analysis, after one month storage, we could find S yes, 2 theta at specific 2 theta. Picks have been regained. It means that devitrification has taken place. When I spray dried plain Lornox scam, it generated amorphous state of the material as anticipated. And when new drug, after one month, was subjected to the diffractometric analysis, again, it found like it, 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 it has become crystalline. Means the devitrification has taken place, right? Now, this is clear. Lornox scam on storage undergoes devitrification. Lornox scam undergoes, you know, form transition from amorphous to the crystalline on storage. This is what we put here. Now, second thing is that, see here, this is what is a dispersion. 1s2 to dispersion of Lornox cam and sericin. This is 1s2 dispersion of Lornox cam and sericin. SED LSO, zero month. Means fray sample we subjected to the analysis. You could find, yes, it is not having anything at all, amorphous material. After one month, like 1475, stability study, no picks. After two months, no picks. After three months, no picks. This is what SD LS3 after three months. It's a three month data. What does it indicate? It indicates that amorphous form of the drug has been stabilized by the sericin. And this neat drug was a control. It has been devitrified. It has been devitrified. Same thing you could find in case of melox gap. Same thing you could find in case of melox gap. So here, sericin has stabilized Lornox gap. Similarly, sericin has stabilized melox gap also. This is what is neat sericin. This is what is neat melox gap. Fresh sample analyzed of Neat Melox cam, SD MLX0. It's a neat Melox cam. It's a pure draw, which has been spread right. And without sericin on storage at 7540, it has gained you know crystallinity. So it has been recrystallized. It has been recrystallized. So some some crystallinity peaks are there. Some crystallinity peaks are there here, but you know they are nano crystallinity, peaks of nano crystallinity. Now, in case of pelodipen, here you can find yes, this is what is unlike Lornox cam, Melox cam. So zero day, some peaks are there, some peaks are there, here you can find. And gradually with the time, these peaks went on growing. These peaks went on growing. This is what is plain philodipin, which was spread, right? It had a certain crystallinity, means on storage, it has regained certain crystallinity. And here, this is what is a philodipin. It's a neat philodipin, which has been recrystallized. Simultaneously, even if solid dispersions of sericin were there, with the philodipine, 
then also recrystallization has taken place. Recrystallization has taken place. It makes us to conclude, yes, Lornol's cam and Melog's cam has been substantially stabilized by sericine. It prevents a devitrification process. Amorphous form has been stabilized and philodipine has been partially stabilized. We could confirm it with the help of differences in spelling colorimetry. So whatever thermograms you could find, Lornol's cam has got this exothermic transition. It is because of melting is associated with the degradation. And you can find, see, there is no proper exothermic transition which is seen here. And uh, this is what is plain Lornol's cam, which was spread right. And this is what is neat Lornol's cam drug without sericin. See, it has been devitrified. Sharp melting uh, uh, exothermic scene, it's because of the crystalline form of the Lorna scam. It has been formed here. Now, in this case, also here from this freshly prepared spray dried melog scam, you could get the vitrification process, recrystallization has taken place. But here you can find see melog scam. This is melting endotherm of the melog scam. See, there is no endothermic transition which is seen. This is an indicator of S. Whatever series it is, its amorphous form of meloxicam has been stabilized. And in case of philodipine, you can just have a look at it. Zero day, fresh sample, first month, C. Endothermic C. F2, F2 endotherm has grown, grown up. Endotherm has further grown up. This is fresh drug without series C. Endotherm is seen, even if intensity is less, depth is less, but it is C. And after one month without sericine, you can find as that of original. Means total devitrification has taken place here. And here, partial devitrification has taken place. Means some form of the philodipine is available in the amorphous form and some has been devitrified. This is what we can conclude from this. So here again, these thermograms, they tell you, yes, stabilization of amorphous form of drug has been carried out by the sericine, especially lanoxam and meloxam, and partially philodipine has been stabilized. If you see the in vitro resolution, so these are the neat drugs. So these last three lines are neat drugs. These are the tablets and these are solid dispersions. You can find very good dissolved over here. In case of tablets, only rate of dissolution has been decreased, but the amount of drug which has been finally dissolved, it is safe. And it's a pure drug. So you can find diso has been improved in case of solid dispersions as well as tablets. If you compare dissolution profile of all those pure drugs along with the solid dispersions, see, <clears throat> Lorna's scam, how much it is getting dissolved? It's a neat drug. 29% drug is getting dissolved. Spray dried Lornox cam without sericine. Initially, when it was spray dried on the zero day, it had 90% dissolution. But on storage, 70 conditions, it dropped down to 33% because the devitrification has taken place. And when we had a spray dried Lornox cam with the sericine, you could find this amorphous dispersion has dissolution of 98.37 and you can find here 95.38% of drug has been dissolved. Even after third month, it means that this is a stabilization of amorphous form and that is the reason why there is significant enhancement in the DSO and this same DSO has been maintained throughout because devitrification which has been taken place, it is list. So physically, we could observe with the help of fingers, we could check its amorphous material which has been generated. Now, in case of solvent evaporated Lornol's cam, yes, 97% initially was a DSO, 82 later on means more was the which took place in case of solvent evaporation. Ball mill, yes, initially generated amorphous system, but uh, you know very well solid state interactions are poor and because of which uh, uh, there was not much stabilization. In case of spray drying, as well as, you know, solvent evaporation, molecular level interactions are very strong when they are in the solution system and because of which better stabilization you could find and it was poor in the Physical, uh, this thing, physical mixture. Now, same thing you could find for meloxicam. See, neat drug, 26%. Same drug, which was spray dried alone, 92, dropped down to 29, at the end of three months. Spray dried, 98, dropped down to 94. Yes, it's a substantial figure as far as DISO has been concerned. And same trend has been continued for meloxicam. Now, in case of philodipine, same thing, 97 initially, 93 further. Means DISO is better, relatively better. But some partial, you know, stability has been gained in case of spread right philodipine. How much it was seen? So this is what we have calculated from the equation for the crystallinity from a DAC thermogram from melting enthalpies. So the spread right Lorna scan at 0 to 1, 2.41 after 3 months, 7.4. Spread right uh, Melox scan solid dispersion, 3.48. After stability studies, you know, analysis, 
completed 8.23 uh, and spread right fenolidine sericin 4.51 to 18.31 so this makes us to conclude yes it is a better stabilizer it is a significant stabilizer and probably you know if you use certain ternary system or certain another technique maybe if you are able to use it probably it can have a better stabilization potential this is what we explore then we went for in vivo studies pharmacokinetic parameters pharmacokinetic parameters they also tell us this is need drug Tmax was three hours. In case of Lorenzo scab tablet, which was given to the rabbit, Tmax has dropped down to two. It means that. So what does you know very well? So this Tmax indicates like the site of absorption, but prior to that, what does it indicate? Solubilization and dissolution. So rapidly, drug is getting dissolved. Or rapidly, drug is getting solubilized as well as dissolved, and that's why Tmax has been brought down. So onset of action has been you know made short. So this is because of. Rapid solubilization as well as dissolution, which you find in all drugs. In same thing, in case of meloxicam, it was initially six. Tmax has been brought down to four. Here, pyridine six four, and area under curve that is an indicator of bioavailability. You can find seventeen has become twenty two, twenty three, thirty one, twenty two, thirty one. It's almost one and a half times enhancement in the bioavailability has taken place. You know, so this can be attributed to the amorphous form of the drug. Obviously, there are certain uh, hypotheses which have been proposed by the people. Protein, as such, they transport the drug molecules via different amino acid transportation mechanism. That could be another, but that is not going to have a major role. So, as far as this, whatever our study has been concerned. So, the next case study, what I'm going to share with you is, so as we said that, like silk sericin, we explored for solubility and dissolve. Initially, when we initiated our topic, what we did, we used to collect. This series in West from Reeling Houses. We used to visit uh, the one region which is nearby to the Kolhapur. We used to visit Islampur. There is one government Reeling House. We used to collect that water. We used to purify that water. I mean, we used to purify that series in. We used to isolate, extract everything. Standardization of series in. We used to do that. And later, we used to use that series in for pharmaceutical applications. So that was the way. But we got to know that as it is a protein. And uh, on storage, it gets immediately degraded. So the limitation of this protein-based dosage form is that, especially sericin. So obviously, when it comes into contact with the water, it gets hydrolyzed, it gets degraded. We deal with sericin applications. Either we have to think of you know non-aqueous systems, or we have to think of solid-state dosage forms. The next application we wanted to explore, like nanocrystal stabilization using silk sericin. You know very well. I'm not going to talk much about it. Stabilization of nano Crystals can be carried out by electrostatic stabilization. Maybe say this drug has got negative charge, and you can use a surfactant. You can use a polymer which has got a polymer positive charge. So this is called as electrostatic stabilization. Next one is steric stabilization. So here in the space, what you can do, whatever polymeric chains are there, they won't allow or the, whatever you know, they, they, they won't allow these nanoparticles to come closer to each other because of the steric hindrance which is being created. So this steric hindrance is one more mechanism. So there are so many papers which are available on cage formation at the surface of nanocrystals. What polymers they do? They form a cage at the surface, and this cage acts as a mechanical barrier. So here you can have a cage of the polymer at a surface, and this is going to act as a mechanical barrier, which doesn't allow these nanocrystals to come close to each other, and that is why it can carry out the stabilization. <coughs> the next mechanism, electrostatic stabilization, you can have in case of nanocrystals. You can have a combination of both. So what we wanted to do. We wanted to check whether silk sericin can be used as a stabilizer for hydrochlorothiazide, and here you can find the results are initial particle size was 251 nanometer. So method which we used in this case was anti-solvent precipitation method. Acetone was the solvent which was used in this case. Particle size at 2 to 8 degrees Celsius storage condition. It was 251. Now it has grown up to 262. Particle size at room temperature 261 to 295. And heat potential was reasonably good. So, what does it indicate? Even after third month of storage stability conditions of accelerated accelerated storage stability conditions, there is not much increase in the particle size. Means substantial stabilization has been carried out by the sericin. One thing I must tell you: so this sericin, which was present at the surface, it was not cross-linked. Sericin was as such without cross-linking. Okay, and still it has carried out stabilization. <clears throat> Now the next application which we wanted to explore it was for fibroin. So as I said in the beginning, so fibroin which is available in the form of small threads, fibroin which is available in the form of small jointed fibers, it is usually thrown by the people and it is sold at the cost of the fifty rupees kg. You know, even even small than that, even at a cheaper than that, right? So we in the beginning we said like fibroin is hydrophobic in nature. 
fibrin has got very high crystallity fibrin has got very high crystallity and because of which it can have a release of drug for a very long time so what we decided can we have a release of drug from fibrin for 12 hours because when crystallity of fibrin is very high so obviously we could find lot of opportunity to modulate the crystallity of fibrin to carry out transformation of beta form of fibrin to the amorphous form or it's alpha form of the fibrin so that was opportunity which was available to us and for that purpose what we did we process fibrin and alginate at a neutral ph in water we process alginic acid you know alginic acid and fibrin both have got a negative charge at that ph conditions and simultaneously viscosity of both is least at that ph condition that was the reason why we processed at that condition so both are negatively charged fibroid is negatively charged so fibroid has got two chains of polypeptide one is heavy which has got high molecular weight which is called an h another one is light which has got low molecular weight you know usually 30 uh, 40 and heavy which is there it has got 400 kilo daltons now so this heavy and light they are linked together by disulfide bridge or you can say disulfide bond is there and you can just imagine you have got this two chains which are negatively charged again i am putting something in which is negatively charged so obviously what will happen there will be repulsion between the negatively charged chains so alginate polymer the fibroid chains itself and because of this electrostatic repulsion what we thought is can we have a customized release for 12 hours that was our objective and uh, hopefully we could do that So for that purpose, what we did, we prepared a microspheres. Yes, this is what you can have a BSE thermogram of microspheres. You can find this is a small endothermic transition. It means that in microspheres, pelodipine is available partially in a crystalline form. It can be available in a molecular dispersed form or it can be amorphous form, and that can be confirmed here with the help of this diffractogram. So this is what is diffractogram of this microspheres of pelodipine. This was a model drug which we selected. again it is bcs2 this is a pure drug this is what is a physical mixture and this is what is microsphere you can see that yes pelodipine has gained crystallinity but here drug attraps was good everything was good encapsulation efficiency was good everything was good and uh, the technological properties of this microspheres were good if you see this release profile as per us fda guidance you can find uh, in 1 hour 15 to 40% release then in 2 hours 25 to 60 in 4 hours 35 to 70 and uh, in case of 4 hours not less than 70% of release was seen in this case it means we could achieve we could manage that crystallinity so that we could have a customized drug release so we could find anomalous release here which is a combination of erosion along with the diffusion now the basic limitation of five, uh, basic limitation of microspheres is that number one thing the leakage of drug may take place and second thing drug payload usually is less in case of microspheres that's the reason why people Uh, think of nanofibers over microspheres these are main two reasons one i said drug payload and second is second is leakage of the drug so these two problems have been very well solved in case of nanofibers so what we did we went for preparation of nanofibers of fibroin by electro spinning process recently a lot of people are working on the electro spinning you know very well so these are the advantages which are being offered by the uh, the nanofibers the low density high pore volume high charge to volume ratio high drug payload high surface volume so these are certain advantages so which makes this nanofibers as a very very attractive research form now it was a very novel thing because uh, no one had tried this nanofibers as a floating drug delivery system we did it and uh, this is a formulation table we applied pat here and we could find that spinner rate speed is playing a major role as far as crystallinity adjustment has been concerned along with the polymer concentration as well so these are certain parameters of the electro spinning process we don't discuss much so the optimized batch was in this i think it was fd4 fd4 was the optimized batch which gave very good uh, long or elongated uh, uh, phase which had very good uh, smooth surface finish mm -hmm. this is a uh, pre dissolution and post dissolution same images here you can find in this 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 is pre dissolution and this is post dissolution so whatever uh, the study was carried out it was in a uh, uh, fast state state uh, condition fssgf and uh, here you can find that so the surface erosion has taken place surface erosion has taken place through which release of drug takes place why i am telling this this is very important because when we go for sgf proper and when we go for a diso point to normal lcl because of the proteinic nature the type of release kinetic model it follows that differs that is the reason why i wanted to show you i'll, I'll show that in the later slide 
So when we went for taking a refractogram of this electrospun nanofibers, you can find, so this is what is a silk fibroid. So it is amorphous in nature because it is obtained by the freeze drying process. So what we did initially, we collected those all joint tail or small threads of the silk, and then we dissolved into the Turner system, which is of calcium chloride and methanol water. And uh, then it was dialyzed. And after dialysis, we could separate uh, silk fibroid uh, uh, after uh, this thing, uh, freeze drying procedure. And after freeze drying, we could get, yes, this is amorphous form of the fibroid. Phyllodipinous crystalline, then physical mixture, and uh, plain phyllodipine silk fibroid nanofibers. These are plain nanofibers, blank nanofibers, divide of drug. This is not having drug. These are drug loaded nanofibers. And here, these are annealed, water annealed nanofibers. Water treatment has been given to this. This is what is ethanol annealed nanofibers. Now, here you can have a clear look at this. See, drug has got two thetas, which are in uh, uh, crystallinity peaks at specific two theta, which are indicating drug is crystalline. But in this case, you can find, so whatever this transition is there, these peaks are there, they are corresponding to the, you know, uh, nano crystalline region and they are present in the nanofibers which are not having drug. See, this, this is fibroid. This is fibroid, plain fibroid nanofiber which is not having drug. It has got this kind of, you know, behavior, this kind of pattern is seen here, this kind of pattern here is seen here. But what is important, whatever principal two theta peaks are corresponding to the crystallinity of fibroid, uh, crystallinity of philodipine, all are missing, nowhere. It means that whatever drug was there, it was molecularly dispersed. Fibroin could very well arrest the movement of the pelodipine. Moreover, after stability studies, we could conclude, yes, it is stabilizing the amorphous form of the drug. Drug was molecular dispersed because the solution was made in the formic acid and it was electrospun. So there is no aggregation, there is no demitrification process. And uh, this is a very good area in which people are working. And uh, fibroin can be treated as a very good stabilizer for amorphous state of the material as far as the electrospinning process has been concerned. And along with that, it has got inherent potential to modulate its own crystallinity so that release behavior can be manipulated. So this is what is the DSC thermogram, the thermogram which is going to confirm again the same thing. Plain fibroin, which is freeze dried, philodipine, physical mixture, then plain fibroin nanofiber, which is not having drug. Now you can see this is drug loaded nanofiber, but this is endotherm missing here. You don't have endothermic transition seen here properly. It means that drug has been molecularly dispersed. It has been stabilized. It is not moving. It has been arrested. And because of which dehydrification hasn't taken place. Now this is next one is F sample is annealed. That is water annealed. So you find because of the annealing treatment, Again, further crystallinity enhancement has taken place because the 3D structure of the protein get changed after annealing treatment. So whatever hydrophobicity regions are there come together and hydrophilicity regions, domains, they get exposed to the water which is used in the annealing treatment. Same thing can be seen in case of, same thing can be seen in case of the ethanol annealing treatment. So here, so what we could conclude, so this annealing treatment can be used for adjustment of the crystallinity so that you can get a customized release profile. Drug is available in the molecular label. Drug is available in the amorphous form. That's the beauty of this electrospinning as well as fibroid. So as I said that we went for its novel application of floating and uh, it had a very good floating profile. Floating lag time hardly few seconds, 15 to 30 seconds. Floating time more than 18 hours and percent biopsy 99%. Both polymers like sericine as well as fibrine, both are mucoadhesive in nature. Both are mucoadhesive in nature, and it has a very good mucoadhesion as well, because when we talk about floating, so usually we combine mucoadhesion with it. <laughs> so as I said, this is what is resolution in point to normal HCL, and this is fast state state SGM. See, the protein behavior got changed. Here we could get a Higuchi release, and here I could get a zero order release. Here I could get a zero order release, with the dissolution medium has been changed. Next one, fibroin as the nanocrystal stabilizer we tested, and it's, it was a very good stabilizer, 251. No, that was initial particle size, 251. It got increased to 271. Yes, some increases there, but it is not much. So here we need to, you know, give a substantial credit to fibroid. Yes, it is stabilizing the things. Particle size 265 at room temperature to 294. Data potential is say minus 18 and minus 18.7. So now here what we can control without cross-linking. 
these polymers they are forming a cage at a surface and which is stabilizing the nano crystals now one more approach we wanted to confirm like i think you might have seen that i think there was only one paper which i could come across so this this hypothesis was like if you have got a drug and if it is having a specific binding site if it is binding at receptors so obviously you know very well that drug binds at a specific amino acid at the receptor site this is known to you all right this as we showed in the docking the lornox cam and melox cam they bind with that specific lysine or you can say lysine you know glutamic acid these are the specific amino acid residues where it is strongly bonding where it is strongly bonding in previous studies we saw that now if we are able to select that amino acid which has got a better bonding with the drug probably you can prepare a system and if fortunately that amino acid which is going to bind from the receptor which is going to bind from the receptor if it is hydrophilic probably that can be a very good amino acid which is going to enhance the solubility of drug which is going to enhance the solubility of drug and that system which you prepare usually it is called as co-amorphous system you know very well right now that concept we wanted to validate here see you know very well just uh, in the composition I, I i told you like say this is one is a sericin next one is the fibroin right serin is abundantly present in the sericin glycine is abundantly present in the fibroin in the composition we said what we wanted to validate if you prepare a co-amorphous system of glibenclamide and serin because glibenclamide binds with uh, you know that pancreatic atp sensitive potassium channel which has got sericin amino acid and glibenclamide binds with the serin residue glibenclamide binds with the serin residue at that channel in the pancreas naprox then binds with the glycine residue in the cyclooxygenase it binds with the glycine residue in the cyclooxygenase and we prepared a dispersion of it and we wanted to see the interactions now here you can find glibenclamide strongly binds with the serine interaction intensity is very high naproxen binds strongly with the glycine interaction intensity is also very high whereas you know we to validate we did it naproxen then uh, this fibroid and sericin we used here also fibroid and sericin uh, we used so from interaction intensity we could conclude yes glibenclamide binds with serine means it is going to bind with sericin also and that is why interaction intensity is high compared to fibroid right so whatever say this glycine is there whatever glycine is there it has got very good interaction intensity it means that it is again going to have better binding with the fibroid so we confirmed it with the help of dissolution profile see need glibenclamide 59% of drug has been dissolved after 2 hours Bolmild glibenclamide solid dispersion with the sericin, yes, 96% dissolved. With Bolmild naproxen with the fibroin, diso is 94. It means that this is a one validation which we carry out, which we carried out. So whatever amino acids are present in this protein, obviously they are going to decide how this protein is going to behave, how it is going to bind, and from that viewpoint, you can use this sericin as well as fibroin for different applications. <clears throat> so this is one area which is you know people are extensively working upon sol to gel transition of sericin as well as fibroin this figure is related with the fibroin and these are applications where people are using it say people are using fibroin in the gel parenteral transdermal drug delivery system in pulmonary as a carrier in implants and orthopedics now as we said like uh, fibroin is hydrophobic in nature it offers plenty of crystallinity modulation opportunities and because of which you can have a customized drug release if this fibroin is processed using the organic solvents if this fibroin is processed using the organic solvents probably it may have implants it may have a biomaterial despite keeping in the body it can stay up to one year because it has got very high crystallinity when i process it in the organic solvents if i process it into the hydrophilic solvents probably it will have a release it will have a degradation in few weeks so this aspect can be taken into account so there is you know huge scope which is available to you you can modulate the crystallinity modify the crystallinity of fibroid and modulate release now when we say that's a parenteral uh, say this is what is sold to gel transition initially it's a sole system which has got converted to gel on resting and uh, you get a gelification because of hydrogen bond and the interactions between this hydrophilic another thin hydrophilic then hydrophobic another thin hydrophobic and uh, this is beta slated or you can say beta sheet or beta plated conformation which is responsible for the crystallinity so this system on shearing this is gel system on shearing gives a sole system 
and on resting it gives a health system like say temperature ph shearing duration so they are involved in achieving soul to gel transition they are involved in soul to gel transition so what i feel is very important whenever we talk about parental application so like you know very well that we want any kind of say nano system which is you know multi particulate system and uh, we want that system in the systemic circulation for a long time but unfortunately that system you know, doesn't skip are a reticular endothelial system and uh, that process you call it as opsonization of that vesicle textplex that's a major challenge every uh, formulator has to think about <clears throat> now in case of fibroid as we said that like even for years also you can keep that system in circulation as biomaterial for months also you can do that but see what you need to do that the system has to be very intact system has to be very intact number one thing and second thing is that the surface has to be hydrophilic because you know very well any foreign object which is having hydrophobic surface it is treated uh, as a xenobiotic by the body and body takes care of it by removal body opsonizes it that's a procedure so if you have got a nanoparticles of the fibroid if you have got you know small vesicles which are having a fibroid and if you decorate this fibroid because why i'm saying decorating fibroid because fibroid is insoluble it is hydrophobic in nature and when it is hydrophobic in nature obviously it will it will be recognized by the body as a xenobiotic or foreign material body will try to remove it immediately by the opsonization procedure so if you need to skip res reticular endothelial system so what you can do you can decorate the uh, whatever fibroid substance is there nano material or whatever it is <clears throat> or micro size materials decorate it with hydrophilic polymer so that it will be ha having hydrophilic surface it won't be easily recognized by the body and it will do the job of releasing the drug for long time so these are the different applications for which it can be also if you have uh, if you want to have a certain implants you can think of this because this is going to release the drug for long time the only thing is that adjust the crystallinity and modulate the release as far as order and even duration has been present <clears throat> coming to the last part of the presentation mulberry leaves we tried for anti diabetic activity so this is what is one dnj this is what is one dnj which is present in the mulberry alba itself morus alba itself this is one dnj and its derivative is miglitol this is clinically available of whose dose is 10 mg per kg miglitol it is a carbose category of anti diabetic <clears throat> and it acts by the inhibition of alpha glucosidase enzyme which is present at the breast border so here we studied this in animal models and we could find yes it has got a better anti diabetic activity so this is blood uh, glucose reduction in 110 this is pure extract this is powder of mulberry leaves this is big excipient powder of the mulberry leaves so substantial blood glucose reduction has taken place one uh, interesting experience of mine i would like to share with you uh long back i think before one year uh, one of my friend we were discussing about like he had a you know severe diabetes and because of which he had developed a cataract so what doctor advised unless and until that sugar comes under control we cannot operate you for cataract so then i said you do one thing uh, you take this mulberry leaves powder every time whenever you go for go for your food you take this mulberry you know so he started taking this mulberry tea mulberry tea prior he used to take a food or he can say lunch and after one month on one day he called me and uh, he said yes my sugar is very very normal now and yesterday only i have been operated for cataract so this was my experience even majority of times i do prefer mulberry tea in many of countries you will find mulberry tea is available mulberry noodles are available mulberry chocolates are available because it has got huge nutritional value it has got huge nutritional value from that view point you can think of this is something nutrient along with the one which has got medicinal importance so it is going to take care of your entire health in a holistic way nutrient as well as a medicine so what are startup opportunities available into the mulberry or you can say sericulture farming so chocolates are available you can think of this because it is rich of calcium then phosphorus nitrogen so many things are there fried pupas they are available they are being served at so many places then mulberry Uh, this thing it it mulberry that blemish skin uh, whitener is there it is used to remove the blemishes sericin you know very well this is moisturizing skin screen sericin itself is uh, hydrophilic it absorbs moisture and that's why it has been used in the moisturizing cream mulberry or these berries are available which have got rosmarinic acid there is a recent report uh, which states that this rosmarinic acid which is present in the mulberry or you can say berries it reduces your blood pressure and it normalizes it 
Mulberry tea, it is available in Thailand, everywhere mulberry tea it is available widely, unlike we people, it is available in Japan. Mulberry leaf noodles, they are also available and it is they are widely given to the kids. <clears throat> Whatever waste cocoons are there, which are damaged cocoons, they can be converted into these kind of handicrafts, ornaments you can prepare. So this is what holding is wife of my friend. And uh, this is something what you can do with the help of these cocoons, which is quite good. So how you can bring about sustainable developments in sericulture? Yes, transformation of main silk industry, mainline silk industry to the secondary functional industries can be carried out. Whatever mulberry surplus production is there, see, when farmer cultivates mulberry, so sometimes it happens, poor cultivation takes place. And this mulberry, what does it do? Simply it use, uses it as a food for animals. Sometimes it uh, converts that mulberry leaves into the manure. Sometimes he simply throws it out, uh, 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 throws it out. Or sometimes it is used as, you know, something, uh, rather it is, it is not used sometimes. So whatever surplus mulberry production is there, it can be used as a food for animals. It can be used as a green manure and uh, whatever waste products uh, such as perforated, or you can say damaged cocoons are there, getting left over larval dissections, whatever we saw in the, uh, that rearing process. So that entire things can be reused, maybe for certain applications, if cocoons are there, handicrafts can be made, something like that. Whatever mulberry, spent mulberry is there, it can be washed and it can be used for medicinal applications. Fruit and biomass, it has got uh, plenty of medicinal importance. It also can be used. Fruits as a nutraceutical, sericin waste, fibroin waste, it can be recycled, pupa as a food supplement. And as I said, mulberry, medicinal, cosmetic, food application you can explore. So this is one startup actually, which our friend has started, which was funded by Central Institute for Research on Cotton Technology. And the name of the brand which they have availed into the market is Mulberry Green Tea by Sam Brew. So it has been started in the Kolhapur nearby to our college only. And this is uh, the one with the professor of whose uh, daughter uh, has started this startup. It's Mulberry uh, Green Tea with the different uh, flavors like say cardamom, Eli, Chiswan and so forth. And it has got plenty of, uh, you know, demand from other countries and uh, they are exporting it. Recently it has been started. Inclusion, sericin, yes, can be established as a pharmaceutical excipient. Fibroin can be used for different scaffold generation. Its personality modulation can help you in uh, customizing, the release, customizing the release profiles. Mulberry leaves can be something which is very, very medicinally important plant. And this can be, you know, a very good plant for network pharmacology to be studied. And uh, one has to think of it. Nutraceutical applications of sericin, pupa, and berries needs to be studied in India. And uh, each domain of sericulture west can be an independent industry. One has to think of it. Finally, I'm very much thankful to CSIR, AICT, Rajiv Gandhi Science and Technology Commission, Mumbai, Shivaj University for funding me. Then my research scholars, Dr. Nikhil Savanki, Rani Dhole, Priya Giri, and Prashant Rathod, without their help, the work would not have been completed. I'm very much thankful to these my students. There is one a small video which was uh, telecasted maybe in 2014, just I would like to show you. It's a small clip of two to three minutes. I think uh, it's in Marathi, but still, after going through the pictures, you will understand how the actual uh, the reading is and uh, this reading is carried out. Just give me that clip. <clears throat> Dr. Namdeal, uh, sir. Good afternoon. Is it, is it audible, man? Sir, uh, are you well? Also, can you hear the sir? Yeah, yeah. Madam, may I audible? May I audible? Dandi sir, you are audible here with us. I have a doubt because he was trying to share a video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay.
Yes, ma'am. Oh, ah, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Uh, ah, was it was it hear? visible, audible video? Uh, no, the the video was not uh, visible. Okay, okay, ma'am. Okay, 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 okay. Yes. I'll stop the sharing. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, uh, interesting session, and uh, you have brought into line like how sericulture and uh, the applications of sericulture into our pharmaceutical field, every component in sericulture, how it can be uh, visibly used. And uh, this platform uh, being a AICT quality improvement program and the audience being young teachers, I think your presentation has thrown a lot of light on how the basic uh, understanding of the materials will help us in uh, building up the formulations and attaining our uh, release profiles. So I think the uh, even the analytical techniques, how they can inter, uh, use the different analytical techniques to understand their materials. So this learning process uh, will help our young teachers also train the young minds in uh, understanding the material and uh, building a stronger uh, profession. Uh, thank you, sir. Dandiki, uh, sir, would you like to say something? Sir. Hello, sir. Good, good evening, sir. Good evening. How are you? How are you? Absolutely fine, sir. Dandiki, sir, has already asked so many questions to the student who has worked on it. <laughs> In fact, I was busy with uh, one uh, the class, uh, family class, uh, three to four. Also, yes, I was a little bit late to join you, but uh, in fact, whatever uh, what I observed, it was a nice presentation and very informative, sir. A huh? uh, lot of things, a lot of work you have carried out on that. Huh? Yes. That's uh, nice to know all these. Huh? I guess all participants uh, ask questions related to this topic or anything would like to get clarified, you can ask, please ask. Yes, please. Participants, please please come forward if you have any questions. Any questions from the participants? In the chat box, I check. No question. I think, sir, your uh, presentation is uh, was very clear and crisp about what you wanted to convey, uh, <laughs> making it very interesting. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful session. Thank you. And I hope it's going to be benefited by many of them. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. you. Look thank forward for many such more sessions. Yes, ma'am. Sure, please. Thank you, Yaro, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, okay, so you can leave the session. Yes, it's okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, let me just please. No, um, no, no, no. Participants. There's an info, uh, it has been observed that you are, uh, you are joining the sessions late and uh, we are having uh, special